Chapter 8. This is the day, Colonel Meacham announced to his family, the second Saturday in Rapinoe. There's been a lot of putting around, but very little maximum effort on the part of this outfit. It has become apparent to me that this outfit is operating behind the power curve. This is not an outfit, sugar, it's a family. It was over a week before the change of command ceremony would take place that would give Bull his first fighter squad. His first fighter squadron. In the interim, he was intoxicated with an overabundance of free time, and his whole frame trembled and fidgeted with impatience. He had awakened on this morning with a hungering need to bark out orders and have them carried out with speed and efficiency. Since they had moved to Ravenel, Lillian had charted his moods like a cr- cartographer, and her instinct for diffusing his temper before it erupted told her this was the day for caution. Early that morning, she whispered to her children in a voice accustomed to conspiracy, keep busy, keep quiet, and keep out of your father's way. Boy was incapable of relaxation. He was one of those men whose blood seemed to flow too fast, whose brain seemed to glow in the dark, whose eyes can never be still, and whose body is in motion even when sitting on a chair or sleeping. Only in his work could he find redemption. Only in the core was this manic quality channeled into a useful function. He was a man without hobbies, except on those occasions when he would challenge his son Ben in some sport. He did not work in the yard, help in the house, wash cars, shine shoes, or anything. His only duty in the household was to issue orders and to marshal the energies of his wife and children, to tasks that he would assign with a sense of exigence. Listen up, hogs, he said to his children. They placed their forks on their plates, folded their hands in their laps, and listened with eyes that betrayed nothing. The Meacham children had mastered the art of staring at their father with eyes that were dazzlingly bland. At promptly 1100 hours, your commanding officer will conduct the first Saturday morning inspection of the quarters. You will be at strict attention by your door as soon as you hear the Marine Corps hymn played on the Commandant's lawn. You will clean up your rooms. You will police up the bathroom. You will help your mother in all matters. You will salute the colors. You will report to me when you are finished. You will work cheerfully until your detail is completed to my satisfaction. You will report to me any goal-breaking on the part of any brother or sister who tries to take advantage of my kind nature and tries to share his or her responsibility. Now, do you have have any questions, he asked. They held their blank stares. They asked no questions, their mother's warning still fresh in their ears. Would my executive officer like to address the hogs, Bull said, turning deferentially to Lillian. Lillian untied her apron and walked over to the table, hit it with her fist, and began to imitate her husband. I want to tell you, Hogs, a few things. First of all, you will. Secondly, you will. Third, you, thirdly, you will. Then after that task is completed, you will. You will. You will. Karen giggled like a handful of toins, coins tossed in the air. Then everyone laughed, but with less relish than the others, but he quickly recovered his lost momentum. Okay, now that the exec has sounded off and you hogs have had the big laugh, get upstairs and police up your rooms. Square the barracks away on the double and prepare for Santini's inspection at 1100 hours. After that, you will come downstairs and help your mother. What are you going to do, Dad? Matt asked. On the head honcho, mister, I don't have to tell you what I'm going to do. I bet you're going to do nothing, Matt blurted out, not perceiving the warning signals giving off, given off by Lillian. No, Bull answered, that's not quite true. I may do something that might be of small interest to you, Matt. If you don't get upstairs on the double, I just may stomp your face in. I haven't finished my toast, Karen complained. Finish it later. The inspection team is due in soon, and we will shine when the general troops the line. When the children had faded silently out of the kitchen, Lillian spoke to her husband in a mollifying, supplicating tone. Bull, you're getting on edge. I can see it coming like I was reading a a map. You're getting nervous and fidgety as a tree full of crows about the squadron, and I just don't want you to take it out on the kids. 
You've been good since you've been home, and I've been proud of the way you've controlled your temper and your drinking. I'm not nervous, he said. Sugar, you have the personality of a jackhammer. You can make inanimate objects nervous. Please relax. I'm relaxed. I'm relaxed. So what do I got to do? Write a book, Bo said, lunging at a piece of bacon. He ate breakfast as he always did by the number. A second piece of bacon was mutilated and consumed in two carnivorous gulps. Next, he drank a whole cup of coffee before he even looked at his fried eggs. When he finally turned his attention to the eggs, he trimmed the egg white up to the yolk. Then he slid a spoon under the fragile, trembling sack of yolk and puffed one, then the other, into his mouth. As was customary in their 19 years of marriage, he left the grits on his plate untouched, an unexpressed but articulate declaration root, rooted in geography that the society he married into had not assimilated him. All the totems of Bull's disenchantment with the South could be carved from pillars of congealed grits. Since they had married, it was a point of honor between them that Lillian served grits and Bull refused to eat them. What had begun as a joke between them had become a resolute ceremony fraught with competition, and even with something deeper, something, even with something deeper, something almost mythological that separated them. I'm going to bury you with a box of grits, she had once told him, laughing at the thought. Then don't bury me alive, he answered. You are such a Yankee bull, living in the South so many years, and you still haven't been touched by the South. The gentility, the courtliness, none of it. I've only heard of one way to fix grits, so I like him, Bull told her, and he was a good southerner. How's that? Well, you start boiling grits in a pot, then you go down by the highway and get some horse turds, or as you civilized southerners call them, road apples. Well, you take the road apples and dump them into the grits. You boil the combination for 15 minutes, no more, no less. When you're done, you pour the grits down the drain and eat the road apples. After he swallowed the egg yolks whole, Bull spread a gluttonous helping of cross and blackwell orange marmalade on two pieces of toast and consumed them with as much noise as relish. Darling, Millian said, have I ever told you that you eat like a pig? Bull looked up at her and answered with orange teeth, Yeah, you yapped about that maybe ten thousand times. You still chew with your mouth open. If you hope to make general, you'll have to learn the table manners of a gentleman. That's one good reason not to make general. I'd sure like to be a general's wife. Well, it don't look like you'll ever be one. Nothing's impossible. Me making general is. Close your mouth, she ordered. I can become physically ill watching you eat. Bull pulled back from the table and belched a low sour note from an old tuba. When Lillian failed to correct him, he screwed up his face again, worked his throat muscles, and summoned an even louder burp. This went an octave higher, more musical, and more evocative of the meal just completed. He saw her wince. When Lillian winced, her whole body was affected. She looked up from washing dishes and saw the river full of small sailboats leaning toward the far shore and knifing toward the bridge, which was not in her view. The day was bright, the water green, and the wind full, as Lillian saw her whole kitchen window fill up with the September regatta as though she were watching a painting that changed as she watched it. The sailboats are so beautiful, it's like... The river is full of white butterflies, Bull. They're having a race. Bull walked to the window and looked. You mean those boats are racing, he asked. Yes, of course they're racing. I used to sail down at Sea Island when I was in high school. Or rather, my boyfriends used to take me sailing. Hey, Bull said, now there's a sport you can get enthused about sailboat racing. Man, look at them go. My blood is boiling with excitement. I'm a veritable bundle of nerves awaiting the outcome of this race. You're such a peasant, Lillian said, going back to her dishes. Yeah, 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 Bull said, walking toward the living room with the morning paper. Finish the dishes. Whenever Bull left the room, it was a natural reflex for him to leave an order behind him. It was efficacious for an officer to keep the troops busy, he thought. And when he exited a place, he left a trail of assignments in his wake, no matter where he was. 
He sat in his favorite chair and began to read the Charleston News and Courier. Already he had heard the locals refer to it as the Newsless Courier, and he had immediately adapted the bastardized version as his own. Each day, Bull poured torrents of contumely on his morning paper. Lillian could hear him in the kitchen. The children could hear him upstairs. Hey, newspaper, give me the scores, would you? Ah, here they are in the damn woman, women's section. Come on, White Sox, give me some hits. Die, Landis, die, so the Sox can buy a decent center fielder. Hey, Mantle makes every catch look easy, while Mays makes a routine pot fly look like his big works catch in the series. Ted hit another one. Had a boy. Thumper. Tell him he flew with Bull Meacham, too. Killer Bruce picking his nose again. He's got two knuckles stuck up his nostrils looking for a lamb's tail. After he finished the sports section, having checked the progress of the White Sox, memorized the rankings of the teams in the majors and the statistical leaders in the race for the three most important battling batting titles, he turned with reluctance and ire to the front page. He could not control the news, and the front page was a source of continuous aggravation to a man who wanted life to be cut into symmetrical quadrants and accessible frontiers. With a bellicose finger, he jabbed at a picture of Fidel Castro. You bearded bag, I'd like to fly an F-8 to Havana, chase you down Main Street, and blow smoke rings up your ass. Oh, and McNamara, cutting fat off the Pentagon budget requests. I can't believe my man Kennedy <clears throat> put McNamara in charge of defense. Russia will attack us with everything she's got and won't be throwing rocks because McNamara cut the fat. De Gaulle. De Gaulle, he said, as if the word caused him physical pain. Lord, why do you put so many jerks in the world at the same time? Amen, he heard Lillian call from the kitchen. Amen, he heard Marianne echo upstairs. Get to work, Marianne, he yelled upstairs. Bull got up to answer a timid knock at the door. Before him was a blue-haired aristocratic woman, very small, elegant, and old. On first appearance, she looked to be composed of various shades of blue and white, in one thin arm threaded with veins and a kind of senescent bas relief was a basket. And the other was a brown paper bag. Good morning, sir, the woman chirped in a voice that reminded Bull of a small extinct bird. I live two houses down from you on the lawn in the old hall mansion. I've been unforgivably derelict for not having paid a social call before now. But my doctor thought I was going to die last week. That's no excuse, Bull said. I know. And I might perish from sheer embarrassment, but no mind. Brought your little gift to repair the damage, she said, handing him the paper bag. Bull peered into the bag unconfidently, paused for a moment, then said, Ma'am, there's nothing I like better than zucchini. Sir, I'm delighted to hear it, and on my next social visit, <clears throat> I promise to bring you some. That's okra. Bull threw his head back, laughed, then invited the woman inside. Come on in and sit a spell, honey, he said in an exaggerated southern accent. I thought you'd never ask. I'm perishing in this heat. My name is Erling Great Grantham, sir. Who are you? They call me Bull Meacham, ma'am. I'm colonel out at the air station. I heard you were a military family. Word travels around fast in this neighborhood. So you, Mr. Bull, are a marine officer. A fighter pilot, ma'am. Best one in the corps. What was your name again, ma'am? I didn't catch it the first time. Mrs. Earlene Grantham. Earlene, huh? Bull grinned. It always tickles me. These names you thought Southerners come up with. Earlene, huh? Sounds like you... Sounds like something you put in your crankshaft. Mrs. Grantham had pulled some knitting from her basket and the click of needles, like the rubbing of the smallest of bones, entered the conversation. Earlene was my grandmother's name, sir. The woman answered, Is Bull a family name? Ha ha, Earlene, buddy, you're okay. Hey, Lillian, he called to her in the kitchen. Come out here and meet my new buddy. Just a sec, sugar, let me dry my hands and I'll be right out. My grandfather was a military officer, a colonel, a major. He died for the great Antietam. 
No kidding. My great-grandfather might have killed him. Then your great-grandfather fought for the Union, I surmise. He fought for the winners. I surmise that your grandpa was picked off while fighting for the losers. My grandfather died nobly in a, for a cause in which he deeply believed. My old granddoodle got drafted. Where are you from, Colonel? Windy City, USA, the hog killer of the world. Chicago, Illinois. Mrs. Grantham nodded her head. I find that easy to believe. Let me get my wife out of here. Early, I married a grit during the war, and her great-grandfather got his behind shot off fighting for the losers, too. You'd have a lot to talk over. But Lillian was already entering the room, closing the door to the dining room lightly as she came. She swept past her husband, and with elaborate gestures that seemed natural on her, she grasped Mrs. Grantham's hand and introduced herself. Hello, I'm Lillian Meacham. So very happy to meet you. You are such a beauty, child. You remind me of myself when I was younger. Did you hear that, sugar? She said, turning toward Bull. Did you ever meet a sweeter thing in your life? But I'm not pretty at all. I just have my mother's strong features, and I'm good with makeup. Honey, I know women who are artists with makeup and are still ugly as homemade sin. You're so sweet to say that. My name's Erling Grantham, Lillian. I was telling your husband here, that strange man with the given name of an animal, that I live in the old hall mansion, two houses down, the one by Peterkin Landing. I would have come sooner to visit, but I've been feeling under the weather. I brought you this present, she said, handing Lillian the bag of okra. Well, bless your heart, okra. There is nothing that the colonel and I love more than okra. Fried, boiled, baked, or raw, I we could eat okra and nothing else. I thought it was squash, Bull said. Honey, isn't it time for you to inspect the children's rooms? Why don't you go on up and early and I'll chit-chat about women's things. Sure. Well, early, it was good meeting you. Pleasure to meet you, too, sir. Come on back to the old Meacham mansion any time you want to, he said, sending the stairs with an earth sign heaviness, his footsteps an intentional warning to his children. In his bedroom, the colonel dressed in his fatigues, laced up his field boots, pulled a pair of clean white gloves out of his top drawer, aligned his belt, then found his swagger stick on his closet shelf. Before he left his room, he turned on the small phonograph wedge beneath his night table, and laid the needle down on the only record in sight. Ten up, he bellowed to his children as the first cataclysmic strains of the Marine Corps hymn reverberated throughout the upstairs room. All troops report to their stations immediately. This is an order. That is an order, I repeat. All troops report to their stations immediately. Ben grabbed a pile of clothes and stuffed them under the mattress of his bed, smoothing the mattress with his hand to ensure that no lumps were visible. Then he repaired the envelope corners of the bedspread, pulling it tightly until it stretched across the bed like a drum skin. He surveyed his room once more, then flung his door open, stood at attention, awaiting the coming of his father. When the choir of two-fisted tenors on the record were proud to bear the title, Colonel Meacham entered the room, slapping the swagger stick in a steady tautological rhythm that seemed ominous, even predatory. He analyzed his son's posture with slouch-hating, dust-loathing eyes. When he held inspections, the colonel's business was posture and cleanliness. Shoulders back, he barked, stomach in. Eyes straight ahead. Don't look at me, boy, unless you're going to ask me for a date. Get your back straight, head back. Damn, you've forgotten a lot in a year. Turning away from Ben, his expression pained, condescending, as if he were performing an odious task among a doomed genus of animal. Colonel Meacham walked over to Ben's desk and rubbed it with a glove forefinger. Then he examined the glove to see if any dust had soiled it. None had. Next, he removed a glove and fished a quarter from the pocket of his fatigues, a new shiny quarter selected from the pile of change on his dresser. The coin was designated to test the tightness of the sheets and blankets to test how well the troops made up their beds. 
Ben had never seen his father use a dull coin for this ceremony. Bo flipped the coin above his head and watched it drop on the bed. It made an anemic, soulless bounce. You call this bed mange, Irene? Yes, sir, Ben answered. You do? Bo roared. No, sir. You don't? Bo roared again. I mean, yes, sir. You mean nothing, Hog. Next time I inspect this room, I want that quarter to bounce up and put my eye out. Yes, sir. Bo turned his attention toward the closet, inspecting the arrangement of shoes, the hanging clothes on the shelves. Your coat belongs on the far left, followed by the shirts and pants, not vice versa, he said as he opened the drawers of Ben's bureau. Your underwear and socks are just thrown in this drawer. No order here at all, troops, he said, flinging the socks and underwear on the floor. Let's check your military knowledge, Bull said, walking up to Ben. Name all the planes I have flown in the Marine Corps. I don't think I remember them all, sir. I didn't ask you to think, I just asked you a question, sports fans. Ben remained at fixed attention, his eyes not moving from a crucifix that hung on the wall opposite him. Then, in an unsteady voice, he began naming aircraft, not thinking of the individual planes, just letting... <clears throat> Real memory... <clears throat> Uh, do its work, these forgotten phantom aircraft winging out of his brain on their own accord. He missed two of them, but they were both trainers, so it's not that important. Both said, turning away from Ben. <clears throat> Bull examined the crucifix. Two demerits here. Jesus has got toe cheese. The colonel's laugh boomed through the house. Walking to Ben's desk, Bull pointed at one of the books with his swagger stick. Look over here, Hog. Is this a skin book? Pardon me, sir? Ben asked, blushing deeply. Is this a skin book? Is this a book you read to pound your tallywhacker? No, sir. That's Anna Karenina. Mom gave, me, gave that to me and Marianne to read. That's a Russian novel. <clears throat>